All right, welcome back to another episode of Creedal Catholic. I'm joined today by Paul McCusker, who is back with us on the reunion tour. You may recall, if you've been a longtime listener, that Paul joined us uh, on two episodes, parts one and two, called From Odyssey to Rome. And that was because Paul McCusker used to work at Focus on the Family, and when he did, he uh, authored a children's audio drama series called Adventures in Odyssey, which I think is still running, Paul. It is. And uh, that was very formative in my childhood. Um, and so, you know, imagine my surprise when Paul became Catholic uh, several years before I did. But I wanted to have mm-hmm. him on the podcast to talk about that journey and to talk about what the church has meant to each of us. Uh, but more recently, Paul went to Rome for the canonization of now Saint John Henry Newman. And I wanted to have him on the show to talk to us about what that was like. So, Paul, welcome back to Thank Creole you. Catholic. Thanks. Good to be here. Well, I just gave away the game, what we want to talk about today, the canonization of St. John Henry Newman. I thought that I I could just share with some of our listeners who may not be super familiar with St. John Henry Newman, who this man was, why he is so important to many people like you and I. And then we can talk about your visit to Rome for the canonization. I have been to Rome. I've been to uh, a mass said by Pope Francis, but I have never been to um to a canonization and so i wanted to hear all about the canonization mass it sounds like it was quite an experience you were sharing with me some material that you brought home from rome uh and i want to want to tell our listeners about this as well um i should mention that the the canonization of saint john saint john henry newman was alongside several other saints do you have that that program oh is it under here oh i have it thank you so the uh, the uh, canonization of St. John Henry Newman, I, I would be remiss if I did not mention the other four saints with whom he was canonized. We will not be talking about them today, but I, w- I want to acknowledge them. So there was John Henry Newman, and then Giuseppina Vanini, Miriam, Teresia, Chiramel, Mancadian. I'm probably messing well up this done. pronunciation. Yeah, but it so. sounds really good. <laughs> <laughs> Dolce Lopez Pontes and Marguerite Bays. Um, so five wonderful men and women of God were canonized on October 9th. Uh, among them, St. John Henry Newman, Um, He was kind of the headliner, and I don't know if that's fair or not, because I'm not as familiar with the work of these other four. Uh, The key thing is they're all in heaven, right? Mm -hmm. And so um, they're all much farther uh, along than we are in that sense, and we can rely on the intercession of all of them. But today we're going to talk about St. John Henry Newman. Uh, John Henry Newman was an Anglican cleric before he was ever a Catholic. He was also an academic and taught at the University of Oxford. And so I have a special connection to him due to my time in Oxford. We actually attended, Sally and I, the um, the oratory in Oxford. And uh, Newman had a special connection to the oratorians and, of course, attended that parish um, for uh, some of his time in Oxford. He was born in 1801, ordained a deacon in 1824, a priest in 1825. Uh, and then in 1845, 9 October, uh, he was received into the Catholic Church. Two years after that, he was ordained a priest in the Catholic Church in May of 1847, and in 1879, he, w- he was created a cardinal. And along that whole that whole period of time, Paul, it may have been you on the podcast uh, last when we talked about this. Was it you who said you think that Newman will one day be declared a doctor of the church? I had heard that rumor. I okay. don't know that I actually said it, but um, I've heard that from several sources. Yeah, and I can definitely see it being the case. This was not a, uh, he was not a simpleton of the mind. He was a man deeply engaged with scripture, deeply engaged with the writings of the church fathers. You know, prior to his reception into the Catholic Church, he was involved with what's called the Oxford Movement because it originated in Oxford uh, with other people like Edward Pusey, who never did become Catholic. Uh, But there were a bunch of Anglican clergymen who were recognizing that the Anglican Church needed to uh, recover its apostolic identity, in some cases uh, move towards uh, what some might have called a reunion with Rome, although um, the movement obviously stopped short of that. But in the course of this, um, several of these leaders of the Oxford Movement, like Newman, eventually did become Catholic. Um, And he has written many books about his thinking along those lines. Um, One of his more famous ones is an essay on the development of doctrine, where he talks about this idea of development of doctrine that he's probably most famous for. And Paul, you and I were just having a conversation before we hit the record button about how um, some people sort of maybe overemphasize that part of Newman's work Mm. and want to make him into a sort of a uh, hero of the the theologically progressive left, and that's an unfair um, an unfair thing to do for him because he was a much deeper thinker than that. What he did was um, develop a theory for how doctrine develops, which is different from saying how doctrine is innovated or invented, because mm-hmm. <laughs> that was never the idea. Um, a book that I've appreciated is uh, Apolo- uh, Apologia or Apologia Pro Vita Sua, basically uh, translates to a defense of my life. And uh, Newman was criticized roundly in the UK 
press for his conversion because he's leaving the national church. He's a nationally known figure at this point, one of the foremost clerics in the Church of England, and he becomes Catholic. So he's uh, sort of a he's sort of painting a big target on his back in that respects. And people tried slandering him and writing all kinds of mean things about him. So he wrote this, um, you know, beautifully poetic in many respects. I think you'll, you, you're more qualified to talk about his literary capacity, but uh, but this beautiful defense of his life where he basically, over five chapters, divides up all the periods of his life and his religious thinking in each of those and gives a defense of his own his own thinking. And we can talk about a little bit of that that later on. Uh, but this man, um, this man was someone who, after he, after he came into the Catholic Church, declared that he uh, felt entirely secure and never had a single doubt. Hmm. And I always thought that was a really beautiful way to think about it. And we can talk about that idea more because that idea has has influenced me in the moment since I became Catholic. And we can talk about why exactly that is. But this is a man who was deeply in love with Christ and his church, deeply engaged with um, his culture of the time, with his fellow clerics in both the Anglican and Catholic churches, um, with once he became Catholic, with the Catholic church and the leadership of it as he was uh, made a cardinal. Um, and, and this is a man who, uh, is certainly, uh, I, I don't know if I should say overdue. The timing is always just right, but I'm glad he's a saint now. It was mm-hmm. a great time. I will say there was some controversy over the timing of the canonization. I don't know if you'd heard this, Paul, but rather than choosing the day of his death for the canonization, mm-hmm. uh, the Pope chose the date of his conversion. And so that kind of riled up Anglicans quite a bit. You know, mm-hmm. what, what are you saying about us, right? Well, I mean, what we're saying is that you're not the Catholic Church, right? <laughs> I, know. I mean, yeah, what do I have to say about you? It's really, <laughs> yeah, not, not to put too fine a point on it, but uh, but that's what we're saying. You are not the Catholic Church. So anyway, um, with all that said, Paul, I want to I want to pitch the mic to you here and ask you, what was it like to be at the canonization here? I, I've been to Rome. Uh, as I said, I've been to St. Peter's. I've been to Mass by the Pope. Uh, but this canonization, you were just showing me some pictures of it. Tell me, tell me about the the weekend. Well, it was uh, remarkable because I've never been to a canonization, so I didn't know what to expect. You I've been, been to, to Rome, Rome before. Yeah, I was there uh, last year okay. with my wife and daughter, and um, and of course, Rome is Rome, and it's I mean, even without a canonization, it is breathtaking to me to be there and love being there. And I was in an Airbnb uh, flat just like three blocks from the Vatican. Oh, nice! And um, it was. Uh, a beautiful experience on metal, many levels, and and a lot of, a lot of it. I don't know if the others who were made saints that day, uh, if they were a driving force for people who came in. I know they were represented by a lot of people who arrived for this, but I just kept getting a sense of the English Americans. Many people who had come on a form of a pilgrimage, right, um, uh, for the event, and I, I mean it was packed. Now, the funny thing to me is I, I wasn't sure what to expect, um, expe- except that, you know, when we go to Christmas, Easter masses, and, and you sometimes think, coming back to my Protestant days, you know, that there's going to be something completely different about it, some completely unique. Um, but in the Catholic Church, the mass is the mass. And, and a lot of these special events are sort of, oh, by the ways, and usually represented through prayers and through the homily and that sort of thing. So. Um, through circumstances beyond my control, I actually wound up on the main stage. So I was like parallel with the altar on the main stage. Yeah, sort of you behind me the, the picture. I mean, the, you were yeah a hundred feet from. Yeah, I wasn't that far at all, and and I didn't expect that uh, when when a friend had given tickets to me and a, another friend who was there, and then his wife went, and um, it was amazing just to be up there i mean that was a huge surprise to us and um i think that uh the overall experience of just the mass there you know at saint peter's is so different anyway just uh, the size of it in the open scope. air right open air and a beautiful day and they um tried to represent the various countries uh for the saints those who were being made saints that day um through the music and through a variety of people who would do different prayers did they do read the things. readings in different languages yeah they did yeah. that and um and the pope in the homily referenced uh, each each person, okay. but concluded primarily with John Henry Newman, some quotes from John Henry Newman about faith and discipleship and moving forward and, and the I, light I, in I, I assume that's not to, uh, to slight any of the others, but Newman was the most prolific writer of all of these. Right. And, and so eloquent. And a I'm, systematic theologian and all these yeah. things. And so. I mean, that's the thing about Newman for me. Uh, it was always 
the eloquence, the, the way he got to the heart of the matter, and then proceeded to work through whatever that issue was, whatever it was he was trying to say, uh, framing it or reframing it in a way that was often very touching. Uh, would, it was deeply spiritual. I mean, I find him to be a constant inspiration to me when I'm reading his sermons, and uh, primarily his sermons. It's, it's kind of like Thomas Aquinas. I find Thomas Aquinas's prayers far more engaging to me than re- trying to wade through his theology. Yeah. So usually it's the unexpected things with some of these saints that appeals to me, and that's the way it is with John Henry Newman. So the canonization was beautiful and breathtaking and astonishing in so many levels. I mean, you just can't be at St. Peter's or in the square and and not feel a, a, a very spiritual dynamic going on there, which is beautiful and was beautiful to finally see it happen. I mean, many people would say that uh, his canonization is years overdue. Right. And frankly, people were surprised that it didn't happen sooner under a uh, previous Pope, under yeah. Pope Benedict. Well, it was Benedict who opened the cause for his beatification. Yeah. yeah. So it's, um, it, it was beautiful and inappropriate for me uh, because Newman was so important to me in my journey into the church, but not for the obvious reasons. It yeah. wasn't necessarily the, um, his, his defense. You didn't read and, his apologia. And well, things. I did. I mean, I was reading that and I was reading his other, uh, essays, but it wasn't that. They didn't um, grip you. Uh, well, they, no, they were fantastic, but it wasn't the thing that was key. And I'll, I'll, I'll just say this part of the story. Um, I didn't realize Newman had written any fiction and I didn't know him that well to know one way or the other, uh-huh. but um, a friend of mine, a dear friend who is a priest who was a key part of my journey into the church as well, he was, I think he was being very sly because he, he and I would talk all the time about art and about story and things that are, are of interest to both of right. us. And one day he said, you know, John Henry Newman wrote a novel and I just read it and I'd love for you to read it because uh, I'd be curious if you think it works because it's a bit didactic right. as a novel. And uh, so you ought to get it, read it, and tell me what you think. Well, this is before I became Catholic. I was on my journey okay. from Anglican to Catholic. So circa 2006-ish. Yeah. yeah. So I'm, I'm on this journey of my own. Well, then I pick up his book, Loss and Gain, which he wrote right after becoming Catholic. And it's a fictional character that to some degree parallels his journey, but he also creates whole new scenarios in which his character is, is experiencing some things that he didn't, but he's exploring them. Right. And um, so I'm reading this book, this novel, and it is resonating so deeply that I actually got to a point where I knew where it was going and actually put it down because I didn't want to finish it until after I'd become Catholic. Oh, wow. I, I, did, I almost felt like it was going to give my own story away. So I actually put it aside, and then I was received into the church. Then I went back and read the last couple of chapters. Oh, that's cool. Which was, which was fascinating. So on many levels, Newman's life, and I'd say that novel, um, probably resonated with me more than the nonfiction stuff and, and, and his essays, though after my conversion and even more recently— I've been reading his sermons and and loving what he writes. He is deeply inspiring to me. And part of it was Newman's conversion. We we do not understand. It's hard for us to understand. Uh, for him to become Catholic when he became Catholic mm-hmm. was in its, was its own scandal. And he basically was burning bridges in many ways, socially, professionally, across the board. Because at that time, to acknowledge anything other than Anglican, the national church, uh, left you high and dry in terms of jobs, careers, and even social. I mean, he alienated himself from members of his family. He certainly was alienated from key people in the Oxford movement who were dear friends to him. In fact, he writes a lot in his post-conversion years about his loneliness, about um, what he lost to embrace what he did. And he doesn't write like, well, aren't I special because I did it. He just acknowledges that the choice, which he felt he had no choice in making the choice. Right. It was inevitable once he got honest about 
what he said was honesty in terms of looking at Anglicanism as it really was at the time, yeah. all the things he'd been fighting for and how it had gone as far as could possibly go. I think that's a good observation. And it's one of the things that I appreciate about Newman. I mean, on top of the fact that every word he writes, it, it, it reminds me of reading something or anything by Lewis, right? C.S. Right. Lewis. Yeah. It just, it just flows. And I imagine them just sort of sitting there and writing and it just flows from their pen almost lyrically because it reads that way as well. Well, you never do get a sense from him that he's doing a PR job. No, you know, nowadays you read a lot of essays and, and someone's trying to prove a point often at the expense of obvious questions that are being asked, but they don't ask them because they don't know how to answer them. Whereas C.S. Lewis, and then going backwards to Chesterton and then back to Newman, the one thing that I noticed with all three of them was their ability to be unflinching about the most problematic points of what we believe or why we believe it or whatever the issue is they're dealing with. They will go straight to the real problem and then address it. And it's the, the, the sorts of things that I might fl- sidestep because it's hard to even figure out. Whereas Newman was masterful at basically acknowledging uh, the pain of something or how difficult something is. or and, and in the spiritual life, I'm not talking about life in general, but right. uh, discipline in prayer or concentrating while praying or, or not getting bored in mass. I mean, the obvious things we all experience, he would tackle head on and then as I said, frame or reframe it in a way that would go deeper and then bring us to an answer. Yeah, I I think um, one thing I didn't mention actually is that Newman was also formative in a sense in my own conversion. Uh, Something that sort of um, jump-started, I guess, my conversion was reading Thomas Howard's Lead Kindly Light. Hmm. And it's a short little book. I think I've recommended it before on this podcast, but the Lead Kindly Light line is taken from Newman, Mm -hmm. who has this beautiful hymn called Lead Kindly Light, uh, and H- Howard, obviously inspired by Newman, goes on to uh, to talk about exactly um, exactly why everyone should be Catholic and why the Catholic Church is the truth. Mm. The lead kindly light hymn is absolutely beautiful. Let me read it here. Lead kindly light amid the encircling gloom. Lead thou me on. The night is dark and I am far from home. Lead thou me on. Keep thou my feet. I do not ask to see the distant scene. One step enough for me. I was not ever thus, nor prayed that thou shouldst lead me on. I loved to choose and see my path, but now lead thou me on. I loved the garish day, and spite of fears, pride ruled my will, remember not past years. So long thy power hath blessed me, sure it still will lead me on, or moor and fen, or crag and torrent, till the night is gone. And with the morn those angel faces smile, which I have loved long since, and lost a while." And that was, if I'm looking at this material you've you've uh, showed me here, Paul, that was the Vigil of Prayer hymn, mm-hmm. the closing hymn for the Newman canonization Thanksgiving Vigil Mass. Mm. Well, they did the vigil before the canonization, and then the next day after, the Monday morning, they, okay. did, um, they did the... Uh, Thanksgiving Mass. So what I'm looking at here, so this it was, the, if that was the vigil, that would have been on the Saturday. It says vigil prayer. So yes, this yeah. okay. Then this would have been this would have closed. Was it a mass? Was it a vigil mass? Um, well, they had a, a series kind of, a little... of things they did that day of, of lectures and a variety of things. I believe it was a mass. I wasn't able to go to that one. Okay. Um, and uh, but I believe it was a mass. Well, it looks beautiful, and they closed on the eve of his canonization with that prayer. Mm-hmm. I, I one of the things I love is that. This is, as we already mentioned, maybe an eventual doctor of the church, a giant of Christian theology and Catholic theology, somebody who was absolutely prolific in what he wrote and mm-hmm. uh, how he talked about things. I mean, if you look at one of his essays, his essays are books, right? I mean, they're they're long, um, they're long in depth things. They're not mm-hmm. what we would think of as a as an essay now, um, especially the grammar of ascent. That's really the one I'm thinking of. It's mm-hmm. it's a long, heady uh, thing. But here's this giant of theology writing lead kindly light lead thou me on you know one step is enough and he's in a very humble way just submitting to the light of christ well and and i don't know that it's it's well known but he wrote that after a disastrous uh trip around europe i didn't know that. where he became horribly ill I mean, he, he actually, there were points where he thought he was going to die. Wow. And and then he was determined to try to get home, and he seemed to be thwarted at every turn. 
because he's visiting Italy and he's going to Rome and he's appreciating the beauty of it. This was before he was Catholic. And he's making his way back and he was thwarted. It all just kept going wrong. And finally, I think he makes it into France and he gets into northern France. And then the boat that he was supposed to take, he didn't get that. He wound up on some freighter. And then they got stuck in a fog somewhere oh in the middle of the, I mean, they're, they're trying to get across to England and they're stuck. And he wrote that while he was still sick and trapped. He could not move forward. He couldn't do anything. And I don't know if you've ever traveled in a way, I know you travel a lot, I do too, where you have some trips where you just feel like it's never going to end yeah, for sure. you're like in a twilight zone yeah. and you will never get to where you're going i feel to. like that with every airplane delay <laughs> <laughs> well that's how he felt and so he wrote the hymn coming out of that now he tweaked it later and as he sure. often did he went back and and as every poet and does right yeah but he it, it it represented a very real physical reality for him as well as the spiritual reality one thing i also want to talk about um that is going back to a point you made about just how charitable he is, mm. how straightforward and yet charitable he is. Mm. In the end of his uh, apologia, Pro Vita Sua, d- defense of my life, um, he has a note. And when I say note, again, this is like, this is several pages long. So it's a long note, but it's a note about the Anglican church. Mm. And I think one of the reasons he, he made this note is because people were accusing him of, you know, disparaging Anglicanism or abandoning Anglicanism, et cetera. And so I think he felt he had to write this note to explain exactly what he thought about the church that he had been baptized in, grown up in, been ordained in, served in, uh, all of these things. And in this note that's about four pages long, he talks about that. And he starts out by saying, look, when I became Catholic, actually, I can read some of the excerpt here. He says, "Um, when I became Catholic, I was not conscious of any change in me of thought or feeling as regards matters of doctrine. This, however, was not the case as regards some matters of fact. And unwilling as I am to give offense to religious Anglicans, I am bound to confess that I felt a great change in my view of the Church of England. And he goes on and says, I cannot tell how soon there came on me, but very soon, an extreme astonishment that I had ever imagined it to be a portion of the Catholic Church. For the first time, I looked at it from without, and as I should myself say, saw it as it was. Forthwith, I could not get myself to see in it anything else than what I had so long fearfully suspected from as far back as 1836, a mere national institution." As if my eyes were suddenly opened, so I saw it spontaneously, apart from any definite act of reason or any argument, and so I have seen it ever since. Now, that's some pretty fiery language, right, mm-hmm. that would that would offend some of his former colleagues. But painful. Yeah. And I don't know that we appreciate, when somebody writes like that these days, we just uh, assume he's on the attack. But for him, it was very painful because he, what he's saying is, I he fought so hard to reconcile Two things that proved to be irreconcilable, especially as Anglicanism was drifting even further away from anything resembling its Catholic roots. And that was where he reached that point of inevitability, Right, where he went, I have been fighting, 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 trying everything I can to save something that may not even want to be saved in the way that he wanted to save it, and then had to come to the conclusion that this is what it was. And uh, that conclusion ultimately led for, to his decision. But for you're right, it would have been scandalous for him to admit that in writing uh, at the time that he wrote it and would have been offensive. Um, but he, he was offensive to many people because, right. just by virtue of his life uh, yeah, and his decision making. And I think the... The bigger point here on this note on Anglicanism is that that's how he starts it out, right? Yeah. This, so this is what I believe. I'm not going to apologize for it, etc. He goes on and says, and this is uh, also very offensive to those who remain Anglican. I looked at her being the uh, the Catholic Church now after he becomes Catholic at her rites, her ceremonial and her precepts. And I said, this is a religion. And then when I looked back upon the poor Anglican church for which I had labored so hard and upon all that appertained to it and thought of our various attempts to dress it up doctrinally and aesthetically, it seemed to me to be the veriest of (laughs) non-entities. So he's spitting fire there. But the reason I bring this up is he also exercises charity. And he in, in the end of this note, he basically says, look, the way to the way for a Catholic to approach the Church of England is now to basically support it in the 
insofar as it you know contributes to the maintenance and extent of Catholic principles, right? Mm. So he says, my own idea of a Catholic's fitting attitude towards the national church, the Anglican church, in this its supreme hour, is that of assisting and sustaining it, if it be in our power, in the interest of dogmatic truth. I should wish to avoid everything, except indeed under the direct call of duty, and this is a material exception, which went to weaken its hold upon the public mind, or to unsettle its establishment, or to embarrass and lessen its maintenance of those great Christian and Catholic principles and doctrines which it has up to this time successfully preached. So this is very charitable, I, th I think, of mm -hmm. him, that he's saying, look, it's not, it's not a part of the Catholic Church. It is not the Catholic Church, but it can help support some of the, the Christian and Catholic principles that the Catholic Church holds. And to the extent that it does, we don't want to cause scandal and division. We want to, you know, support our friends who are in it. Well, it's an unsentimental ecumenicalism. Yeah. In that rather than deny the differences, rather than pretend like they don't matter, right. he's acknowledging that they do, but that there's still great value in there. Uh, I, I know that, for example, I have dear friends who bristle whenever uh, something that sounds like a, a Protestant hymn is sung in the Catholic Mass, mm -hmm. you know, wh whatever it may be. Amazing Grace. Yeah, yeah. something so like that is done in, in the Mass, and they're, they're bristling. It's like, well, that's not written by a Catholic, and it shouldn't be here. And then I'm reminded by kindly priests and others who would say, yes, but there is redemption and value in that. It's not against the church. Right. It's not teaching false doctrine. It's not working against anything we believe as Catholics. So there's nothing wrong with embracing uh, those things that are good and valuable and do nudge people in the right direction. I mean, he makes, I'm probably living his point. I don't know that I ever could have made a leap from being Baptist to Catholic. Yes, true. That would have been impossible for me. Um, so the value of Anglicanism, uh, looking back on it in this respect, uh, not singularly, but the value for me um, in that period of my life is that it guided me into the Catholic Church in ways that I never would have experienced without having been Anglican. So that makes his point. There is great value all the way through in terms of what it's doing. He's not advocating, you know, dismantling it, right. even though he could be very critical of it and mm -hmm. was in many ways. I, I think you're spot on. And that fits with something that we've talked about on this podcast a lot. And that is what does true and good ecumenism consist of? Mm -hmm. Does it consist of papering over our doctrinal differences mm -hmm. and just saying, let's all hold hands and sing Kubaya? Mm. Or does true and good and beautiful ecumenism involve being clear on where we disagree and on where we agree? And I think that's where that's where Newman is exceptional in his dealings with the Anglican Church, mm. because as we've said, on the one hand, he says this is not true. And on the other hand, he says, um, you know, to the extent that it does proclaim what is true, th that is good and we can support it. Right. And I think that's a good model for us in all of our ecumenical dealings and especially sure. you and I as former Anglicans in your case as former Baptist and you know, everything in between perhaps um, that's a way that we can look back. I mean, it's, it's been hard and I don't want to get into too many details on here, but it's hard when you, when you become Catholic and your family is not right. Mm -hmm. um, there is, there, there's a loss and gain to use Newman's expression. Right. Mm -hmm. And, and it's painful for the person becoming Catholic and probably honestly more painful for the person, for the people who are, you know, in their view left behind. Right. Yeah, because you're the one making the conscious choice to do it. It might be painful for you, but it's probably more painful for your loved ones who see you as as leaving them behind. Right, and there's no way to frame it without it feeling offensive. Exactly, to them. you are rejecting. It's not enough that you've made a choice that is not the same as their choice. The fact that you made the choice is a rejection of their choice or they feel that that's right. that's what they're thinking is that oh well he's thought this through he's just made a decision that you know i don't agree with but it's fine but for some people it's deeply personal and by the way we have to remember when newman made the leap he was viewed with distrust on the catholic side right they didn't know if he was well, there's a reason it was two almost two years clothing kind of thing where yeah. he was coming in as an anglican and now he was going to try to mold the, the church in his <laughs> yeah uh, you know sort of a, a subversive anglican working within the church right. to make it more anglican and for the entirety of the rest of his life he was in conflict with uh, accusations of teaching heresy um, that got all the way to the vatican there were bishops there were other converts uh, who reached higher levels in the church 
uh, that came after him mm -hmm. uh, through misunderstanding, miscommunication, or whatever. So he he was getting kind of knocked around on both sides. Yeah. It wasn't like, oh, Nirvana, I'm in the Catholic Church now, and everybody <laughs> loves me, and all is good. Yeah. Um, it didn't work out that way at all. You're absolutely correct that it was not Nirvana, but I do think it's interesting. You know, a lot of times, and and we talked about this briefly when you were here previously, I think I asked you, do you have any regrets since becoming Catholic? And you talked about um, how you don't, you know, how there are some things that um, maybe you wish you knew or certainly some things that you wish were different, right? Like mm -hmm. good music and parishes, for example. <laughs> um, but ultimately you said you don't have any regrets, right? No. Um, and same thing, same thing with me. And I think people often look at converts and and think that we have regrets. And maybe they look at when we're having difficulties and think that we're having regrets or we're having doubts. And one of the things that I really appreciate about John Henry Newman is how clear-headed he was. Despite all of the loss that he faced when he became Catholic, he was very clear about whether or not he ever regretted his decision. Mm -hmm. And in his apologia, if you look at chapter five, which um, as I mentioned, this is it's five chapters that are basically summaries of his, as he calls them, religious opinions in a period of time. So chapter five is the position of my mind since 1845, 1845 being the year that he was received by the church. He says, um, let's see, he says, from the time that I, I actually love this, from the time that I became a Catholic, of course, I have no further history of my religious opinions to narrate. Now, you might read that and think, oh, you just stopped thinking, right? Mm. But he says, in saying this, I do not mean to say that my mind has been idle. I did not stop thinking or that I have been or that I have given up thinking on theological subjects, but that I have had no variations to record and have had no anxiety of heart, whatever. I have been in perfect peace and contentment. I never have had one doubt. Now, if I'm reading that, it's easy for me to think that's a little bit too much to hope for, right? I think it's it's natural for for humans to wrestle with their faith, right? It's natural for humans to wrestle with difficult doctrinal questions, etc. Fortunately, uh, the great saint clarifies himself here and explains more about what he talks about this. And he says, um, when I when I say that I didn't have any doubt, I'm not talking about difficulties. He says, for example, um, let me find where I am here. Oh yeah, he says. Um, as to the difficulties, right? He says, many persons are, sens are very sensitive of the difficulties of, of religion. I am as sensitive of them as anyone, but I have never been able to see a connection between apprehending those difficulties, however keenly, and multiplying them to any extent. And on the other hand, doubting the doctrines to which they are attached. And this is the famous line that you've probably heard, Paul. 10,000 difficulties do not make one doubt. Mm. So, uh, and then he goes on to, to give the analogy of a man who um, has a math problem in front of him. And the solution to this math problem escapes him. I'm sure everyone who's listening to this has had this at some point in their lives, maybe going back to grade school, but there's this math problem. You know there's an answer, but you can't figure it out. Now, Newman points out that the process of being frustrated by not being able to, to figure out the answer is not the same thing as doubting that there is an answer that exists mm -hmm. or doubting that the answer is correct, right? So you can be perplexed by a math problem and simultaneously not doubt that there does exist some sort of solution out there to the math problem. It's just not to totally apprehendable by you or to you. Mm. Um, and so I really appreciate that about what Newman says there. And well, I and it's like going even further when you say, uh, I have a problem with the math problem. I don't see what the answer is. So I reject math. Exactly. Yeah. Completely. Right. Uh, math is rubbish and I'm never going to do math again because it's there. And, and, and that is a key part of it is the, any disappointments I've had, uh, as a Catholic, are with certain things, but not at the core of of the doctrine or of what I believe and why I believe it. And I I I came into the church um, knowing already that there are flaws, foibles, things because we're human beings and it's filled with human beings, and there are going to be problems and collisions and things like that, which Newman experienced over and over and over again, and. I guess that's the part of the, when we say, I don't have any doubt about my decision. And part of that is not confusing doubt with, he says, with difficulties, because yeah. they are too clear. And that's what I love is the clarity of his mind. We are very mushy thinking <laughs> these days and we Especially lump me, things yeah. together and I do it all the time. Yeah. But when you can separate and be very clear, identify things, difficulties are not the same as doubt. Yep. And I don't know that. Uh, nowadays, because of artists and because of, of songs and doubt is the thing that you want. In fact, it's almost fashionable to say, well, if you're a Christian and you don't have some doubts, then there's something wrong with right. you. And I'm going, well, no, actually, I don't have doubts about the things that I think are essential to my Christianity. Does God exist? Yeah. In fact, 
the existence of God has never been a question for me. I've right. always believed that he existed. I mean, I, and I believe he exists. So that's a whole different thing. So the difficulties are not the same as the doubts, as he, as he points out. And also, when I think about doubt, sometimes I'm pragmatic enough to say, where would I go? Because my question is, if something just went horribly wrong, and I don't know, the Catholic Church went the way of Anglicanism, and it's kind of this free-for-all theologically and otherwise, and heaven knows what it could become, I don't know where I'd go. Mm -hmm. I can't go back. I mean, I think that's part of what he says, too. There is no going back. Um, and some people have done it. I wouldn't know how to do that. I wouldn't know how to go back. I love aspects of my Baptist experience and my formation there. I love a lot of things about my Anglican experience and formation, but I cannot fathom going back to them. And I don't mean that arrogantly. I don't mean that as a sense of superiority. It, it would be like me trying to put on clothes in high school and Going back to being in high school, I, I wouldn't know how to do that. Right. So then, of course, raises the question, well, where would I go if it all somehow went wrong? And all I can say is I believe the Holy Spirit is protecting the church, and we won't get to that. I may squirm and feel uncomfortable and think maybe we're at the precipice of something, but we've seen in church history, and that's what I love about church history, we've seen it happen time and time again where it looked like it came up to the edge, and then God in his mercy protected and pulled it back, even when you were down to one or two people that were hanging right, on exactly. for dear life. Yep. So uh, I wouldn't know where to go, and I think that's a big part of what Newman is saying. Well, you're in good company, Paul, because it reminds me of something else we've talked about before on this podcast, and that's the words of Peter in John 6 after the Bread of Life discourse, mm -hmm. when uh, Jesus says, you know, will you also go? And Peter yeah. says, to whom will we go? Yeah. You have the words of eternal life. That's it. Um, so yeah, that's that's beautiful, and I absolutely love that. Let's wrap it up here, Paul. But before yep. we do, um, you brought some biographies there of John Henry Newman. Uh, one of them was recommended to you by another, and I think we might that might be a good one to recommend to our listeners. Right, and one is um, I, I've been told by a credible source. I hate to name names, <laughs> yeah. you know, but he's very credible and well known. And he actually said that he thought Newman and His Age by Sheridan Gilley is one of the best biographies of, of Newman. Um, some of the biographies, and even some of the ones that they would call classics, are agenda-driven. I And I, when I was doing research on Newman, actually in a lead-up to the canonization, um, I must have half a dozen or more of different biographies. And I do find that many of them are filtered through an agenda sometimes, um, uh, where they focus in on one part of his life or one thing that might even be considered controversial, and then um, uh, twist it around and suddenly make it the single thing. Newman was far more complex than that. Mm -hmm. He was not about one single thing. He was actually exploring a lot of things throughout his lifetime and in his writings. And by the way, he was a man of letters. You talk about essays and his published works, uh, the volumes of letters that he wrote and where he poured out himself. Uh, th by the way, and the fascinating thing about him is what you do not get is a sense of difference between the John Henry Newman who is writing publicly and the John Henry Newman who is writing in a personal letter. Yeah. You still have the continuity. It's not like some of us where you got two different realities going on, the public life and the private life. And the tweets, it was, the text yeah, messages. <laughs> it was the same. It was the same person in both, which was always thoughtful. Sometimes he could be very cutting. Sometimes he could be acerbic. He could get very satirical in some of his comments, but always with heart, never to destroy someone, even if we could argue that he had cause to. Um, so uh, another, by the way, is John Henry Newman by C.S. Desain. I guess that's how you'd say it. D-E-S-S-A-I-N. Sure, we'll go with that, yeah. Um, which is another very good one. And um, But th there are a lot out there, And but I think the Sheridan Gilly is probably, if anybody's looking, wants to get to know him better, I, I think I'd point to that first. So Sheridan Gilly, the biography of John Henry Newman, and mm -hmm. you also mentioned Loss and Gain, John Henry Newman's novel. Loss and Gain, if you want to take a look at his uh, one of the two pieces of fiction that he wrote, I would say Loss and Gain is an excellent place to go. And I would recommend uh, Apologia Pro Vita Sua. Well, yeah, of course. Uh, yeah. And if you want to read what he's maybe best known for, 
uh, an essay on the development of doctrine. Yeah, and remember <clears> that the uh, his discourse, his uh, apologia, is is much what Lewis did years later with his surprise by joy. Right. You know, it is one of the considered next to maybe Augustine one of the great spiritual autobiographies of all time. I um I it, something you said though, Paul reminded me to just mention something on this podcast as you as you uh, implied rather directly. Um, some people have tried to sort of hijack the Newman narrative for mm-hmm. their own purposes. He is a complicated figure, um, but he is a good figure. Yep. And um, the two things that I can think of maybe foremost in the ways that people try to sort of distort his personage is one on his development of doctrine contributions. They want to paint him as a man who was open to doctrinal innovation, uh, but that's not the case. Um I'm not a I'm not a Newman scholar, but I know enough to say definitively, and I'm familiar enough with his work to say that he did not view the development of doctrine as equivalent to the invention of doctrine. Mm-hmm. So, um, if you read his essay, there are several uh, multiple criteria that something has to make in order for it to be an authentic development of doctrine. Um, that is an elaboration of revealed truth made more clear to the faithful, right? So this is not um, this is not him sort of uh, becoming an apologist for these new and innovative ways of doing things. Um, a second way, you know, I read an article a couple years ago, probably at this point, by Andrew Sullivan, who talked about um, the many respects in which the church has failed, the church as in the Catholic church, has failed gay Catholics. Um, I agree with some of the things he says in that article about how the church has just done poorly in its ministry, has not equipped people um, to deal with questions of sexuality. We live in a hypersexualized culture, and the church does not help people um, engage with the serious questions on those lines um, and has treated people who do identify as gay as sort of outcasts and has not ministered to them effectively. I agree with that. Um, what he does, though, is identify some figures in history, including John Henry Newman, who had a very close friendship with um, Ambrose St. John and who's actually buried in a, in a uh, grave right next to Ambrose St. John. Um, he sort of implied that Newman was, you know, a, a closeted homosexual who was living contrary to the church his whole life. And um, that's just a bunch of nonsense. It's not supported by any subject of history. Yeah, there's, there's no evidence for that. And one of the early biographies from the 1920s tried to suggest it and then was soundly thrashed right. by Christopher Dawson's book uh, that explored the Oxford movement. Right. But he, he actually goes out of his way to address that. There's absolutely no evidence for it. And, and the thing, if I could just say it very quickly, is when the left or the right tries to claim somebody like Newman, to singularly say, he's our guy and here's why. Right. Newman was complex in a lot of ways, and we have to remember he was a man of his time. And so uh, the approaches that he took and the kind of life that he lived and choices that he made were part of his time. Right. And then when we try to apply, for example, a word like evangelical, well, you use a word and try to apply rules, modern rules of evangelicalism, if you can identify what those are, and put them back to a Newman or back to Wilberforce or to others of that time. Doesn't they work. would be bewildered yeah. by what you're claiming evangelicalism, evangelicalism is. And that is what the mistake we make. We go retro in our thinking, our thinking, trying to apply it to those people from 150 years ago, and they really don't line up. In fact, it, it leads us completely to misinterpretation, especially in a hypersexualized generation where the idea of a man who wants to be celibacy or believes he's called to that, or even the old um, gentleman Englishman, you know, the uh, Englishman like C.S. Lewis's brother or others who never married and never really were interested in marrying. Right. When our hypersexualization, we're going, Oh, well, if they're not with women, then they've got to be with men. Of right. course, nowadays they could be with any number of things based on the free for all that we're in. Yeah. But we have to be very careful when we're going historically to these people and trying to interpret their lives through our filters. Yeah. It doesn't it doesn't line up, it doesn't work. It's a good point. And I, the only other thing I'll say, and this really is a longer conversation for another time, and I, I would like to have um Eve Tushnet or Ron Belgau on the podcast to talk about this idea as well. But one other thing I'll say is that because we are in a hypersexualized culture, as you were just alluding to, Paul, uh, when we look at these people, we see a very close male friendship, right, between John Henry Newman and Ambrose St. John. And if you, I mean, if you look at the end of his apologia, he has a little, um, you know, a little afterward 
or acknowledgements, and he thanks many people, uh, and he thanks especially Ambrose St. John, who has been, you mm-hmm. know, a very steady support and all that stuff. And yes, if you read this um, to our modern ears, it sounds a little bit odd for a man to be writing about another man this way. Um, but again, we have a hypersexualized. That's the thing. Once once we've ruined friendship. Yes, that's and that's what I'm getting at. Yeah, uh, yeah, we've ruined friendship by trying to apply some rules of sexuality where it doesn't apply. So Ron Belgau, if you're if you're a listener and you're intrigued by some of these ideas, uh, I'd encourage you to look up Ron Belgau, B-E-L-G-A-U, or Eve Tushnet, because both of them are um, committed Catholics um, who uh, identify as gay, um, but also follow and obey and believe the church's teaching on God's plan for human sexuality. And um, they are really trying to help the church recover this idea of spiritual friendship. Mm-hmm. Um, so close friendship between two persons, perhaps very much like that of um, St. John Henry Newman and Ambrose St. John. Mm-hmm. So uh, I'll just leave that there. We can we can maybe table that for another another day. <laughs> Paul, before we go, though, what are you working on now? What should our, our, reader, our listeners know about the Augustine Institute where you work? Well, the Augustine Institute is still forging ahead with, in, in a lot of innovative ways. I mean, we've got formed.org. We have video series that we're constantly releasing. My area tends to be more story-based. So we have the four audio dramas that we've produced. They're fully fully produced with multiple actors, sound effects, scores, And those are all informed, thing. right? And those are available there or purchased through the new site we've created called catholic.store i checked it out yeah yeah which is i guess you could call it a catholic amazon or something i mean it's it's, we've got everything there um i've ventured into children's stories so i have for first readers the event adventures of nick and sam which is part of this bigger thing that i'm creating called the hope springs universe it's like marvel but uh, for (laughs) catholics um but it's very slice of life but then i'm also doing for the 10 to 12 13 year old group uh, a new series of books uh, that it loosely tied into to the adventures of Nick and Sam, but they're the older brother. They actually involve time travel. So th- they're called the Virtue Chronicles, and those um, first ones come out. I'm just finishing up the second one. That should be out in the next couple of months, and then there'll be a third after that. Uh, so we've got tons going on, and AugustineInstitute.org is a place to go just to check it out. Sounds great. Tell me real quick about the ESV Catholic edition. Well, that's exciting because um, for years, Crossways, the publisher for uh, the ESV, which many of us considered probably the best in terms of of the combination of readability, but, uh, but also the translation. And um, since it's come out, it's been a favorite and we've lamented there wasn't a Catholic edition and crossways being a staunch pub, uh, Protestant publisher for years said they Not weren't you going it. to do it. Yeah. Well, then in the last couple of years, they actually gave permission to India, some uh, Catholic uh, Catholics in India to release a Catholic version. We found out about it. We then established a relationship with Crossways at the Augustine Institute, and we now have the rights to the Catholic ESV uh, version. And um, it's out now. Um, We've just released in time for Christmas uh, kind of a very, I want to say, a a luxury paper version of it. It's a high-quality paperback, and then there'll be other additions coming out in leather and hardback and that sort of thing. But it's faithful uh, to Catholic. They allowed the slight tweaks to some of the verses that uh, lined up more accurately, yep. we think, with not only the translation, but of course with church teaching. So uh, that's out now. And um, uh, and as I understand it, we will also be distributing with Ignatius Press this forthcoming book, by um, Pope Benedict and Cardinal Seurat uh, oh, about I didn't realize celibacy. That. I've heard about this book. I so, actually just heard about this two days ago. Yeah, I well, like, it only, they up. only just announced it in yeah. the last couple of days. And what I found out then on Monday at our office was that we will be in partnership with Ignatius to um, to distribute that. Great. Well, thank you so much for coming on, Paul. Sure, That's my exciting. pleasure. If you are interested in um, checking out any of this stuff, that Paul just talked about, AugustineInstitute.org. Mm-hmm. If you want to buy that high-quality paperback ESV Catholic edition, catholic.store, you can go check out that new storefront mm-hmm. for the Augustine Institute. And uh, stay tuned for more editions of the ESV Catholic edition from the Augustine Institute coming along. I know I'm definitely going to... I think, I think I'll, I'll pass on the paperback. I'm going to wait for, uh, for a nice leather-bound copy I can get my hands on. Mm-hmm. Paul. All right, thank you so much for joining us, Paul. It was a pleasure to have you. Yeah, great um, to be here. As we close, I, I noticed you brought this uh, little prayer card from your pilgrimage to Rome for the canonization. And I thought we could 
close this uh, with this prayer to St. John Henry Newman. Mm. Remember us in heaven, St. John Henry. Obtain for us the gifts you sought for your friends here below, the grace to follow the kindly light of faith, belief that is firm and true, a heart to speak to the heart of God, and a voice to give praise to the holiest. Obtain for us the courage to follow your teaching and example, in loyalty to Christ and the church, in love for the Immaculate Mother of God, and in compassion for the perplexed. Obtain for us support all the day long of this troubled life, till the shades lengthen and the evening comes and the busy world is hushed and the fever of life is over and our work is done so that the Lord in his mercy may grant us a safe lodging and a holy rest and peace at the last and that we and those for whom we make this prayer may pass with you from shadows and images into the fullness of truth and love. We make this prayer through the same Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. St. John Henry Newman, pray for us. All right, thanks so much for joining us on another episode of Credo Catholic. I want to make three quick corrections to some little factual errors I had earlier. One was I said that John Henry Newman attended the Oxford Oratory. That's not correct. It was not built when he became Catholic. He was involved, as I understand it, in uh, you know organizing and supporting its construction. But he, uh, I think, was received at the, in Maryville at the Oratory, which eventually became the Birmingham Oratory, as right. I understand the history. He wanted to go back to Oxford later, yeah. and they blocked him. Yeah. They said, no, you're too controversial. It's it'll, it'll be too probably problematic. Probably a fair decision. Right. Um, so I, I messed up that. Apologies. Uh, also, I think I said that Benedict the Sixteenth opened the cause for his beatification. Benedict the Sixteenth um, declared him beatified, as I understand it. Uh, St. John Paul II uh, declared him venerable in, I think, 1991. Um, and then he was canonized, obviously, just last year. And I think I said he was canonized on the 9th. His feast day is the 9th, which is the day of his reception. I think the canonization actually happened on the 13th, Paul. It was you you the were 13th. there. There it is. All right. So the 13th it's was on the, the program canonization. The 13th. Sorry, <laughs> so, I wasn't even thinking about the dates. So that was yeah. my third factual error. Uh, apologies on that. But thank you. Thank you so much for listening to another episode of Credo Catholic. Email me, Zach, Z A C, at CredoCatholic.com. If you have any comments or questions for Paul, just email me and I'll be happy to pass those along. Mm-hmm. Until next time, thanks for listening. God bless you. Mm-hmm.